thanks for joining us today at Salvation Studio House. My name is Marjorie McHugh, and Richard and myself pastor this church here in Didsbury, Alberta. We sure hope you've been enjoying the video series on the life and death of Mr. Badman. And I'd just like to bring to your attention again that this book is the third book in the trilogy of um, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress, Christiana's Progress, and the life and death of Mr. Badman. So if you haven't checked out any of our videos or read any of our illustrated message reviews on those books, go ahead and do so on our website, salvationstudiohouse.com. If you haven't read this book, The Life and Death of Mr. Badman, you can find the link on our illustrated message tab, or you can go to preachershelp.net and click on their books tab, you download it into your um, mobile device or onto your personal computer, and read along with us. Uh, today we are going to be starting chapter 9, part 1, and it's entitled Badman's Fraudulent Dealings to Get Money. You can read on pages 74 to 77. Now, we talk a lot in this book, in the last chapter, chapter 8, it talked about how Mr. Badman um, dealt with his creditors, okay? And in this program, we're going to be talking about how he dealt with his customers regarding money and anyone else that he had business dealings with. Now, you might say, man, this book sure has talks a lot about money. But the scripture came to me while I was preparing for this program where the Bible says in the New Testament that the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And so we're seeing those things come to light in this book. So today on the topic, we're going to be talking about weights, measures, balances, and scales. I'd like to read a couple of verses from the Old Testament to start. The first one is in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, 35 to 36. You shall do no injustice in judgment, in measurement of length, weight, height, or volume. You shall have honest scales, honest weights, an honest ephah, and an honest hen. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The second scripture is in Deuteronomy 25, 13 to 16, and it says, You shall have in your bag different you shall not have in your bag differing weights, a weight and a light. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God is giving to you. For all who do such things, all who behave unrighteously, are an abomination to the Lord your God. So the argument would be then, Mr. Badman is a sinner, correct? And so he was only doing what he would naturally do as a sinner. As we have done in all of these programs, which I've found just to be tremendously helpful, is we like mirroring it in the life of the Christian. How does this book and what has happened to this man apply to the life of a Christian? You know, God's word is, is true, whether... Uh, it's in our perception or not. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So everything in the scripture is true. And that's what we have to uh, see in ourselves as Christians. So unjust weights and unjust measures, really another word for it is lying. And in our, some of our earlier programs on this series, we've talked about uh, lying and it has no place in the life of Christians. I'd like to read what wise men says, and we'll start on page number 76. Thus you see how fully and plainly the word of God is against this sin and all that fall into it. Therefore, Mr. Badman, in that he used these things to rook and cheat his neighbors, is rightly rejected from including his name among the role of the godly. Whether it is counted an evil or a virtue by men, it doesn't matter. You see, in the scriptures, the judgment of God is upon it. It was not counted an evil by Mr. Badman, nor is it by any that still follow in his footsteps. But I say, it is no matter how men count these things, but how they measure up to the judgment of God. And rather, because when we ourselves have done weighing and measuring to others, God will weigh and measure both our us and our actions. When he does so, he will shortly, and then woe to him to whom 
and any of those actions shall it be said by him, Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. God will then recompense their evil of deception upon their own heads when he shuts them out of his presence, favor, and kingdom forever. Naivety would say that these kind of different weights and measures and um, balances and scales aren't practiced in society today or maybe in developing countries still, but that is really not true. And today we also want to look at it. Is it really in our evangelical churches? It does happen. And I'd like to read the story of uh, Jacob and his father-in-law Laban. For some of you, it might be a familiar story. So we're going to read in Genesis 3, uh, pardon me, 31, 4 to 13. So Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to, to the field, to his flock and said to them, I see your father's countenance, that it is not favorable toward me as before. But the God of my father has been with me. And you know that with all my might I have served your father. Yet your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore speckled. And if he said thus, the streaked shall be your wages, then all the flocks bore streaked. So God has taken away the livestock of your father and given them to me. And it happened at the time when the flocks conceived that I lifted up my eyes and saw in a dream. And behold, the rams which leaped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. And the angel of God spoke to me in a dream, saying, Jacob. And I said, Here I am. And he said, Lift up your eyes now and see. All the rams which leap on the flocks are streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. For I have seen, and this is just the wonderful key, for I have seen all that Laban is uh, doing to you. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made me a vow and made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land and return to your family. Just as Jacob saw God justifying him for the injustice and the differing weights and balances that happened to him regarding his livestock, so God is going to justly defend you. In the Bible, um, in Daniel 5.27, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. We made reference of just a, a couple minutes ago. It says, uh, Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales of righteousness and found deficient. So in, in these balances and scales, there's deficiency. And when we look at it in the life of um, Christians or in the evangelical church today, we can see that there is a deficiency. You know, God is really just in all of his measurements. He is just in everything that he does. God is not unjust. As I was preparing uh, this message, a couple things came to me in, in the supermarket. Let's say when you go to buy some uh, meat, you're asking for 250 grams. So here's the thought. How do you know that those uh, scales haven't been adjusted? Or when you go to fill up with gas and you're putting in, uh, you know, 25 liters of, of gas into your vehicle, how do you know that those pumps haven't been adjusted? So those are some examples. Or here's another one, you go to your favorite coffee place and uh, here in Canada, anyhow, they've taken the penny out of our market. So what they've done is when you go to pay for something, it can be $1.53, let's say. Well, if you're paying cash, you're not going to get those pennies back. Uh, if you're paying with your debit card, it's going to go through at the right amount. So what's happening if you're dealing with cash? Either they're going to scale you down or they're going to scale you up. So usually it's scaled up and you're cheated out of a few pennies. And you think, well, Marjorie, what's a couple of pennies? Well, no, when you add that up, the whole population across our nation, those pennies add up. So you can see here even how it's crept in in such a subtle way for us to discredit uh, a, a just balance and a just weight. So there are a lot of examples that we can uh, look at and probably as you're listening to the program you can think of some unjust balances and weights. And as I mentioned earlier, what are some of these injustices and these unequal balances and weights that happen in churches and in um, Christian media? Let's, for an example, uh, making untrue statements about how many 
first time salvations, healings, or deliverances was at a, a certain rally or campaign or crusade? Or how about um, camera shots that focus in really tight and the preacher is saying, oh, there were just thousands and thousands of people when there might have been a few hundred people. Shots like that can, are very deceptive. And it, what it's doing, in essence, is trying to motivate you, the viewer, to give to their ministry. And it's not a far stretch to say that. Some of you might say, well, Marjorie, that's just a far stretch. You're really reaching on that one. But not really. It happens. And it's, it's very unjust that a ministry would do that. Or um, there are a number of other examples embellishing the truth or how about rerunning testimonials of uh, to put into a program and it's a rerun, but you're not telling your audience, yeah, this testimony was shot five years ago. And instead they're putting it in and they're making it seem like to uh, endorse what they're saying, they're running this testimony to make it sound like it is for real. Or a better example would be a testimony that they're putting on their program of somebody that uh, who is l no longer uh, living in walking with the Lord correctly. Maybe they've lost their healing or their backslidden or a number of things, and yet they're still using that testimony as a present day reality and there's no truth to back it up. So these are things that are are very credible that happen in, in churches and in um, television ministries. And you might say, well, why is it fraudulent? Why is that fraudulent? Because as I said, another word for this is lying. They're not being truthful about what they are communicating and they are trying to draw you in so that support can be given to their ministry, that you're sending in your financial support to this ministry when the things that they are not even saying are holding truth. Another example would be of uh, yearly raising money that's designated for a one-time project. How often have you heard that on, on many TV programs? We've got this one project and we need your money. 100% of the money is going to be going to this project, so we want you to give. Um, it's it's does designated absolutely 100%, but in reality, maybe one dollar out of the ten that they're asking you to pledge is going to that specific project and the over and above the nine dollars is going to, for other ministry expenses why is that fraudulent because they're not telling you the truth they should say you know what out of your ten dollars one dollar or five dollars is going to go to this project then they're being truthful and upfront about it but if they're not it's deceiving the viewer, in, uh, all for financial gain, all for those, um, the support that they want come in for their ministry. They've committed, they've communicated one thing, but they are doing another. Uh, they're visually showing one thing, but they're doing another. The ends do not justify the means. It's unequal balances and unequal uh, measurements and weights. I'd like to take us back to the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 25, 13 to 16. And we read this at the beginning of the program, but I want to just highlight something again. It says, you shall not have in your bag differing weights, a heavy and a light. You shall not have in your house differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure, that your days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord your God is giving to you. For all who do such things... All who behave unrighteously are an abomination to the Lord your God. Your life length depends on if you're living uprightly and justly before the Lord. God is using the strongest of words when he is talking about those who defraud by this way. He was so descriptive in saying, you shall not do this and you shall not do this. You have to live uprightly before the Lord extortion of the poor and that's what some of this was mentioning and what we're going to be reading about now in Amos 8 4 to 12 extortion of the poor will uh, not only affect you physically regarding a long life but also spiritually it says hear this you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail saying when will the new moon 
be passed that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath that we may tr trade wheat, making a, an ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and even sell the bad wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this, and everyone mourn who dwell in it? All of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down uh, at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son, and its end like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but listen to this, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Shall they wander from sea to sea and from north to east? Shall they run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it? Spiritual famine is a result of these unequal just uh, weights and unequal balances. It's ministers who can't even hear the word of the Lord anymore. They're, because of their sins in their, how they're treating the poor and the needy. We just read that. There's going to be, there is a spiritual famine that happens on those who are practicing evil in this way, robbing the poor and defrauding them by unjust weights and balances. Let's go on to read what it says uh, with the prophet Micah in uh, chapter 1, 6 to 14. Some more very powerful things here, and showing how much God just does not like it when this is practiced amongst his people. Th remember, these prophecies were spoken to the children of Israel, and in the same way, they were written for an example for us. So we can't just treat it as that's Old Testament and it doesn't apply to the church today, it does. So it says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts to you priests who despise my name. You wonder how is that even possible? Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? But now entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us. While this is being done by your hands, will he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts? Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so that you would not kindle the fire on my altar in vain? I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it in that you say the table of the Lord is defiled and its fruit, its food is contemptible. You also say, oh, what weariness, and you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen and the lame and the sick, thus you bring an offering? Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am the great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Isn't that powerful? He says, would you, would you offer this to your governor, to your prime minister, to your king, to your royalty, or bring it down even personal? Would you offer something to your CEO? Is it second and third best that, that has flaws and, and uh, it, it's not perfect? And yet God is saying, this is what the children of Israel were doing to me. And we could say in the church today, this is what Christians are doing today. They're throwing their offerings at me in a contemptible way. I, I, I'm serious. 
throwing their offerings in a contemptible way. Here, God, and they throw it in the offering plate. That, that, that should be sufficient. In the same way, there's a, there's a real, um, uh, there's a real hand of the Lord, a spirit of conviction, I believe that's on some right now, that God is dealing with your heart saying uh, about your offering, how you're giving your offerings to the Lord and you're treating it with contempt, you're sneering at it, and it's like uh, just tossing it before the Lord. I'd ask you and encourage you right now to repent. While you're watching this program, we don't give our second best to the Lord. We give him our very best. We give him our fruit, first fruits. And we do it with honor. We do it with respect because he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. We don't do this in an in a evil way, uh, despising and sneering. And he even called out the, on, these, on these prophets, these, um, the children of Israel. We could say in the church today, it says, uh, you are weary and bored and you're yawning in the services saying, oh man, these obligations and these things that God is requiring of me, they're just way too heavy. Really? Really? Is that really what's in your heart in serving Jesus Christ? It ought not to be that way. It is an honor. It is a privilege that we are called the children of the Most High God. We, when we make promises to the Lord, when we make vows to the Lord, we keep them. Proverbs 20 verse 10 says, Diverse weights and diverse measures, they both alike are an abomination to the Lord. Also in Micah 6.11 it says, Shall I count pure those with the wicked scales and with the bag of deceit, the, the deceitful uh, weights? You know, true repentance is... Um, like we saw in the life of Zacchaeus, the tax collector that Jesus called down. He was up in a sycamore tree and God called him down and says, Zacchaeus, I want to eat with you today. So it says, the story is in Luke 19, 8. It says, when, then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore for." Fold. So let's say an example, Zacchaeus had a million dollars, okay? Immediately he said, I would give $500,000 to the poor, just like that. And if I've defrauded anyone else, what I have defrauded from them, I am going to give back fourfold. That is true repentance. See, Jesus saw his heart, and that's exactly what's going on in the churches today. There has to be a spirit of repentance. You can't continue to snare people for financial gain, for money, for padding your pockets, and for being just blatantly lying from the pulpit and from the television platform that God has given to you. I know it's a heavy word today, but these things are not just in the life of the sinner as it was in the life of Mr. Badman. These things are in the life of the church and they really need to be repented of. In closing today, I'd like to read from the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 16, and I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. And his gifts to the church were varied, and he himself appointed some as apostles, special messengers, representatives, some as prophets, who speak a new message from God to the people, some as evangelists who spread the good news of salvation, some as pastors and teachers to shepherd and guide and instruct. And he did this to fully equip and perfect the saints, God's people, for the work of service to build up the body of Christ, the church, until we all reach oneness in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, growing spiritually to become a mature believer, reaching to the measure of the fullness of Christ, manifesting his spiritual completeness and exercising our spiritual gifts in unity so that we are no longer children, spiritually immature, tossed back and forth like ships on a stormy sea and carried about by every wind of shifting doctrine by the cunning and trickery of the unscrupulous men, by deceitful scheming people who are ready to do anything for personal profit. That's what it's in there for, for personal profit. But speaking the truth in love in all things, both in our speech and our lives expressing his truth, let us grow up into, uh, in all things into him, following his example, who is the head Christ. From him, the whole body, the church, in all its various parts, joined and knitted firmly together, is what every joint supplies. When each part is working properly, causes the body to grow and mature, building itself up 
in unselfish love. After reading this scripture, this is why we go to church. We go to church so that the gifts of the Spirit can be in operation, that we can be built up, that we can be edified. And not just ourselves personally, but that you can exercise your gift to build up and edify uh, each of those around you as we're commissioned to do. I know it's a really weighty word today, but I, I believe that uh, there's a scripture that comes to my mind in, in Philippians 2.15. It says that we are to live above reproach in the midst of a crooked, crooked and perverse generation. We have to shine um, our lights. Do you have differing weights and differing measures in your heart that you need to ask for forgiveness on? Are you going to church today and you're bored and you're yawning and you're sneering at leadership? I didn't say it, it said that in the script. Okay, I'm just repeating it, but that's how strong of a word this is today. Is there a spiritual famine? Pastors, ministers, those of you who are watching right now, you can't even hear the word of the Lord anymore uh, due to your sins of exploiting the poor by falsifying the scales of deceit. Does that apply to you today? I would really encourage you to allow the Holy Spirit to bring conviction upon your heart and repent today. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I lift up each person who is listening to this program. I know, Holy Spirit, that you've brought conviction upon their hearts. And I ask right now, in the name of Jesus, that you bring them to repentance. Father, I thank you for a spirit of repentance right now on each one who is watching, that they would repent where they have compromised, where they have lied, where they have had a double standard, where they have not acted as a true believer in you. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for repentance in Jesus' name, that they would put away every weight that would easily beset them, anything that would hold them back from following you. And I give you thanks right now in the name of Jesus. In our next program, we're going to be wrapping up this chapter. I'd encourage you to go to our website again, Salvation Studio House, and click on our illustrated messages, watch the messages that we've written, and not just on the life and death of Mr. Badman, but on Pilgrim's Progress, Christiana's Progress, the Holy Spirit series. And uh, if you're in the Didsbury area, we'd love to have you join us for our church services. We have Salvation Theater on Saturday nights at seven o'clock, where we highlight Christian movies. And then our Sunday church service, we have it at three o'clock in the afternoon. Pastor Richard always delivers a very powerful word. We have a wonderful time of worship. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation and we are just loving it. God is doing such wonderful things here. So thanks again for joining us and we are looking forward to having you with our, us on our next program. 